it's good to see all of you. Welcome to the Breakfast Forum. One announcement before we begin, and that is, um, this is usually true in a room full of Episcopalians and Episcopal friend, friends of Episcopalians. There's room up this way. You have chairs, and there are a couple of open tables um, up this way, so you're welcome to join us as you come forward. Rabbi Michael Greenstein serves Temple Israel as the senior rabbi. He has been there for a number of years. And it is really, really difficult for me to pick and choose from Micah's biography and list of accomplishments and accolades exactly what I should say to you in a brief introduction, because I know that we need to be brief in the introduction because you are here to hear him, not me. He's literally, he's accomplished too much. So I'm going to be very, very brief <laughs> and tell you the two things that I think are most important for us today. First, Rabbi Greenstein brings to us two complimentary gifts. Two gifts that we often, sadly, keep separated in our own day and age. And those are the gifts of thoughtfulness and humor. They belong together. I believe that there are two sides of the one ticket to the spiritual, and he is usually handing out those tickets in abundance. And last but not least, Micah Greenstein comes to us as a dear friend. Micah is a friend of Great St. Luke's. He is a friend of the Episcopal Church. And in the scriptures, there is no greater joy than welcoming a friend into one's presence, into one's home. So I know that you will join me in welcoming you back to the Rector's Forum in Great St. Louis. Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to thank my friend, your Rector, uh, for that reassuring introduction because my children do not think I'm funny anymore. <laughs> and. Grace St. Luke's reminds me of Temple Israel in that the toughest seats to get, whether in the sanctuary or the social hall, are the ones in the back. <laughs> so if anyone's arriving, please sit at the rector's table. <laughs> I, I think one of the, truly one of the great um, recent additions to my life uh, as a minister in this community um, is being an FOL, a friend of Lawson. Um, you have tremendous clergy here, and I just wanted to applaud. Is this working all right? It's tingy. You know what? I'm, I'm, you know what? I think it's my hand. How's this? Is that good? Much better. Good. Uh, the other thing about Grace St. Luke's and Temple Israel, the reason why we're kindred spirits, is uh, I know some of us are still recovering from the Grizzlies hangover. And what we need, um, I think, is uh, martini religion for those who want to be shaken and stirred. <laughs> and I was thinking driving in, that's what I love about the Episcopal Church. Um, <laughs> while you and Reformed Jews are billed as the frozen chosen, uh, you you not only comfort the afflicted, but you afflict the comfortable. And, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, uh, the world is, is too small for anything but mutual care and deep respect. And uh, the world is too great uh, for anything but responsibility for one another. And uh, that's what your stream of Christianity uh, preaches, and even better than preaching, um, lives. So your rector and my friend has given me the task this week and two weeks from now to address the book of Job and the contemporary quest for wisdom. And I don't know if you realized, uh, perhaps most of you realize this, but so that we're all on the same page for today and on May 5th. Uh, the reason for his title is that the book of Job is part of what's called the wisdom literature. And the wisdom literature is not just the book of Job. Um, it, it also includes uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. 
And I want to make sure, as I said, we're on the same page before we go into Job, uh, because there's a temptation to just rush to an isolated text and not to understand the context. Um, what makes the wisdom literature different than all other books of the Bible uh, is that all the other books of the Old Testament, we're speaking of the Hebrew Scriptures, they center on um, my people, your cousins, your brothers and sisters, the, the people of Israel, um, the laws, the guideposts for living, the commandments of Judaism, um, our spiritual struggles, our, our political history and destiny. Um, but here's the kicker. In the wisdom literature, there's no reference at all to anything specifically Jewish. These books, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, deal with general human affairs as if they were written uh, by people who weren't Jewish um, for non-Jews. Um, the Proverbs represents the wisdom literature in its most confident mood um, before it began to move into, as we know, the book of Job, which questions, as we're going to see. And you might say there's a progression to Ecclesiastes, which is complete um, skepticism. Uh, the book of Proverbs is, is calm um, in its mood. There is none of the intense self-expression of the book of Psalms. Um, or uh, there's no great sense of mission. There's no spiritual oneness with God. It's hardly a spiritual book at all. The book of Proverbs, it's not inward. Um, it's not emotional. Um, it deals with practical counsel. Um, even the definition of happiness in this wisdom literature is practical uh, and earthly. Happiness, what is happiness according to the book of Proverbs before we get to Job? Because we're going to see it taken away from Job. Long life, good health, wealth, contented family living. So it's practical counsel on how to attain success in life. And um, this is the wisdom literature in its most confident mood. And it applies somewhat to the book of Ecclesiastes, less to the book of Job, in which we were going to plumb the depth of human suffering. Um, so before we move to the book of wisdom literature, that's our focus, um, I, I want you to remember Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, and the book that's most like the book of Proverbs um, in the wisdom literature that didn't make the final cut of the Bible, unless you are a Catholic, um, is the book of Sirach which is in the Apocrypha. So the wisdom books deal with the problem of human happiness for the average man and woman. Now, I feel compelled to say this because I am Jewish. Although Israel is not present as a specific theme, the wisdom books are nevertheless Jewish wisdom by implication because there's no agnosticism in them. God is real and God is just. Even Job, who suffers, never abandons his conviction of God's justice. And the books are Jewish also in their concreteness. You know the old joke, what's Jewish history in three sentences? They try to kill us, we survive, let's eat. So these wisdom books are very Jewish in their concreteness because when the Greek writers deal with themes such as um, happiness, it's always theoretical. What is happiness? What is ethics? And then the Greek philosophers try to cast um, and work out exact definitions for these ideas. The Jewish wisdom books are not interested in theoretical definitions, but in practical experience taken from daily life and in simple and direct counsel on how to live. Now, 
we're going to ask the question, who was Job? Uh, the book of Proverbs, as many of you know, is ascribed by tradition to? Anyone? Solomon, exactly. Um, I'm not going to ask you to open your Bibles, but uh, why is that? Because it says in the book of Kings, 1 Kings 5.12, he spoke 3,000 Proverbs. Now, maybe some other time I'll... I love teaching Proverbs as well in the, in the literature. Uh, it, it looks like there are lots of different writers to the book of Proverbs, and we could show that by the opening of certain chapters referring to other Proverbs or here are more Proverbs. But let's leave the book of Proverbs, and let's mention the last of the literature in the wisdom literature before we get to Job. And that is one many of you know, it's the third of the three wisdom books, and that is Ecclesiastes. And this book may be looked upon as the climax in a somber way after Job, um, its final disappointment, because the book of Job begins to express doubt about the connection between wisdom, goodness, happiness. Uh, and it demonstrates, as we know, that even a righteous man like Job can be miserably unhappy. However, and this is what we need to remember as we wrap up two weeks from now, the book of Job holds firm to its conviction of um, God's ultimate justice. Ecclesiastes comes very close to complete skepticism. It not only doubts, um, as Job does, the wisdom doctrine that righteousness receives reward in life. Ecclesiastes doubts the wisdom of wisdom itself. It says that life is meaningless, so you might as well have as what pleasure you can. And then it even doubts the satisfaction of pleasure itself, calling it folly. Everything is ultimately meaningless, says this pessimist preacher, right? You know the line, right? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Um, and yet, before I leave, because it's only in Episcopal circles or those who, again, who look critically at the text, could I speak of the text this way? Because it's easy to preach. But to delve into the inconsistencies of Ecclesiastes, because even with its pessimism are sentences that contradict the negative of the rest of the book. For instance, I just want to quote to you, um, Ecclesiastes is called Koheleth in the original Hebrew. Uh, it's useless to try to accomplish anything. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, right? Ecclesiastes 1.15. Um, furthermore, this hopeless crookedness of the world is due to God himself. Because if you read in Ecclesiastes 7, it says, Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight from which he hath made crooked? Yet in direct contradiction with this pessimism that all of life is twisted and meaningless, he says... Four chapters earlier, he hath made everything beautiful in its time. Likewise, Ecclesiastes denies that there is any life after death and that man is possessed of a soul which makes him superior to the beast. Who knoweth the spirit of man, whether it goeth upward and the spirit of the beast, whether it goeth downward to the earth? And yet, in direct contradiction to that, Ecclesiastes speaks of the immortality of the soul, which some of us read at funerals. And the dust returneth to the earth as it was, and the spirit returneth unto God who made it. So I'm telling you this because the rabbis of the Talmud, because we have to realize they had a convention, not a Sanhedrin, but to decide what made the final cut of the Bible. You ever wonder why some books made the final cut and why some books didn't? Song of Songs, Erotic Love Poetry, NC-17. It's racy stuff. If you want to read the Bible in public schools, leave out chapter five of Song of Songs. 
unless you really understand a metaphor. Um, the rabbis in the Talmud said originally they wanted to keep this wisdom book out of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, because its words completely contradicted each other. They knew every word of scripture, not like a preacher cherry picking a verse, but like a computer chip in their head. And they, they saw that all the words of Ecclesiastes, many um, categories, completely contradicted each other. But being rabbis or rectors, they found a way to harmonize these contradictions. And as a result, they're part of our sacred scripture. Um, so we're dealing with this question of wisdom and Job. And now we know the context of Job in this wisdom literature. Like all the books, like the other two I mentioned, Job does not mention the specific um, history or the problems of the household of Israel. Um, it begins and deals with problems which apply equally to all of us. What does the, the name Job mean? It can mean in Hebrew, Eov can mean howler, hunted, uh, enemy, the one who is um, attacked. Believe it or not, and I'm going to read to you directly from the Talmud, um, the book of Job is a complete parable. Some rabbis in the Talmud uh, question whether the man himself ever existed. You know the old statement that there are some things that are true that never happen, and there are some things that didn't happen that are completely true. And Job is every man, they said. His story of suffering and final reward um, was startling and extraordinary, and is the parable of, of human suffering. Unlike the book of Proverbs, it lacks the rather easygoing confidence that any life can be happy if it's managed with wisdom and motivated by righteousness. Um, and the very um, contrary is the mood of Job, right? It declares that a person can be completely righteous and yet suffer endless misery. Uh, so it may be viewed as an answer to the confidence of the book of Proverbs, right? And it can also be understood as a refutation of the popular misunderstanding of the teaching of the prophets. What do I mean? The prophets taught that God is just and that man is duty bound to obey God, right? So the popular opinion concluded that if a person suffers misfortunes, then it must be because he or she has violated the will of God. In other words, let me put it in southern terms, that all sufferers must be sinners, right? All sufferers must be sinners. And this seems like a reasonable inference, but and here put on your Episcopal glasses, it's not what the prophets really intended to say. It's much more nuanced than that. Because it is true that the prophets insisted that certain specific suffering can be a punishment for evil. As for example, um, the sufferings of Israel uh, due to idolatry, right? If you follow this path then, or um, the injustices will lead to punishment. But think about the prophet Jeremiah, who speaks of his own suffering and demands to know why he is afflicted um, when Jeremiah says himself, I haven't done anything wrong. Certainly the prophet Jeremiah realized that not all who suffered should be denounced as sinful. You follow me? 
The notion that suffering is always a punishment for sin ignores one of the most tragic questions in human life. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper if God is just? It's another way of rephrasing the whole book, right? Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper if God is just? And the book of Job faces this question squarely. But it cannot be said, I'm going to argue, that it answers this question successfully. Perhaps this question can never be fully answered by our human intellect. But the book of Job at least deals with the problem and reveals it in a more realistic light than ever before in scripture or arguably in any other classic literature. I'm trying to, I, I'm not uh, as well versed in the New Testament even though I took four courses in rabbinical school on the New Testament and I read a lot. But I think it's the book of James who speaks of the patience of Job. W which book is it, the patience of Job? James, thank you, friend. It is James. Um, James only read the first half of the book or was only referring to the first half of the book because Job is not very patient. That's what we're going to see. You have to go all the way through chapter 42 um, to, to hear why that phrase, patience of Job, really only speaks about part of the book. Uh, you know the story. Uh, it describes one of the righteous of the Gentiles who lived in ancient times. There's a prologue and an epilogue. I was trying to think about how do I cover all 42 chapters um, in a setting such as this and even getting you to open your text, which I'm going to do on May 5th, but uh, we may look at part of it now. But basically the outline is there's a prologue, an epilogue, and at the end of the prologue, um, it ends with the statement that when Job was sorely afflicted, you know, ten children, they die, his wife, all he, wealthy man, loses everything. Um, it ends with a statement that when Job was sorely afflicted, his three friends, I'll hold you in suspense, uh, uh, I prepared this in two parts, but we're going to talk about today, without translating their names, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. These three friends come to um, comfort him and then follow the dialogues between the three friends and Job, right? Job begins by cursing the day in which he was born, wishing that he had never lived, since life involves such suffering. You probably have friends or family members who could have said the same thing. Eliphaz says to him that all men are prone to sin and that God is correcting whatever sin Job may have committed. And this is where it's not the patience of Job. Job rebukes Eliphaz says that his friends, I mean, what kind of friend are you? You should be consoling me in my time of suffering. But instead, <clears throat> you're accusing me of being sinful? The other two friends are worse. <clears throat> They're blunter in their accusation that Job must have sinned or he would not have suffered. Job denies this. But he adds that it's impossible for him to prove his innocence because who can argue who can argue successfully with an almighty God? Um, he wishes that God would let him speak. And in spite of his suffering, though, as you all know, Job, this is why the wisdom literature still affirms God. He says, yea, though he slay me, yet I will trust in God. He'll trust in God's justice, but he'll never do as the friends do, who try to flatter God thinking thus to please him, you know, will you not show him favor? That's chapter 13, verse 7, 8. And I think what makes this the ultimate Jewish text in our shared Hebrew scriptures is that the faith of Israel, and I think your faith too as Christians, is not one of passivity. It's one of protest. 
If we look at the story of Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah, will the judge of the world not judge people with justice? Abraham schools God, talks God into saving people because what God's thinking of doing uh, will be unjust. When Moses has to talk God out of destroying the entire people. Uh, this is not a religion of um, resignation. Um, it's really a call to cry out in this world and to always speak up, stand up, uh, and not do what the three friends basically told him to do. Uh, in two weeks, the big red flag for any of you, if you hear a religious leader say, this is why bad things happen to good people, and they give you one answer, that's the red flag. We're going to see in the book of Job, there are two answers alone in the book of Job. There are two more answers in the book of Lamentations. And so this question that we're facing squarely, that Job never answers completely, but offers two, two responses to when bad things happen in your life. And I'll just give you a preview. We'll look at it next time when we open the text. In Job 38, when bad things happen, it's no one's fault, often. But what can you do? And then in Job 42, it's going to be when bad things happen, it's no one's fault. But now that it has happened, what can I do? What can we do? The other predictable religious responses are, um, it's your fault uh, and you need to repent. Or we could say, I think of five now, it's God's fault and I'm mad as hell. That's actually in Lamentations. God is, and, and, then, and then the writer uh, gets scared. Oh my gosh, he's my boss. I can't say that. <laughs> Um, but it's who, who doesn't get angry when, when bad things happen to good people and there's no... And then, um, but Eliphaz, the first of the, quote, friends who comes to Job, um, expresses the thought that no person can be just by God's standards. So Job should be happy that God corrects him. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. This is what Eliphaz says. To which Job replies, are you kidding me? You dig a pit for your friend. Bildad, number two, feels called upon to defend the justness of God. Doth the Almighty pervert justice? That is to say, the very fact that Job is suffering proves that he is evil, or else it would be proof that God would be unjust. Job responds that even though he is just, I, I, this is stacked. I can't prove my case against this DA, but how dare you? And the third friend, Zophar, denounces Job for claiming to be righteous and assures him that if he really is, um, were righteous, then he would be confident and happy. That's what the third friend says. If you really were righteous, you'd be confident and happy. Job, responding, says, Zophar, my friend, why are you trying to defend God? God doesn't need such a deceitful defense. I know that my Redeemer lives, but I want to know from God himself what his defense is. He doesn't need you to defend him. Um, 
God's answer, of course, we're going to see. And by the way, there's an environmental message in the book of Job that we're going to look at in two weeks. Um, that, that amazing passage, uh, maybe I'll, I'll read from it today or have you read from it. Um, God's answer is that Job should realize that as, as, as wonderful as Job is, he cannot know the great mysteries of life, the mysteries of creation and of life and of the animals of the field. The world is an ultimate mystery to us. You know, the plans of God are wise and just. And um, so these speeches, that's really what the body of the book of Job is. Um, they bring so clear a vision of God's purpose, but it all ends up, as I think you would agree, that life is ultimately more a mystery than a machine. Um, and Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. I abhor my words, repent, seeing I am dust and ashes. In other words, Job admits that the mysteries, you know you're right, God. Uh, I didn't deserve this, but I don't understand it all. And I'll still trust in, in whoever and whatever you are. And um, then what happens? God rebukes the friends. God does for seeking to defend God falsely by untruthfully accusing Job. And then they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> God gives Job everything back. <clears throat> so, though Job was deeply religious and a saint, I don't think a single Jewish child has ever been named for him. I don't know. Have you done a baby naming here? Are there any Episcopalians named Job? I don't mean to defend, uh, to, to insult anyone here. Maybe there's a Job in the crowd. You know, you name, you name your child Noah, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, but no, no Jobs. Um, and that's because he led the most pained life of any character in the Bible. Now, now that I've given the more academic uh, overview, let's talk about a few odd elements in the biblical book that bears his name. Now remember this because you're so conditioned by your wonderful scriptures in the New Testament. We have the shared scriptures of the Hebrew Bible. The angel Satan makes his only appearance in the Hebrew Bible in this book. And God is cast in the morally dubious role of wreaking havoc on Job's life just to show off to Satan. This is why the rabbis were so befuddled by that, you know, this this is a parable. This, this can't really be a real person, even though it could be every person. Because the story starts in the heavenly court, where a discussion is taking place about Job, who's an unusually, as we all now know, a generous and pious man. Satan makes fun of Job's piety, claiming that it's no great wonder he's so religious, since God has bestowed every possible blessing up on his head. And then if you read chapter 1, verse 11, I don't want to waste time since we only have 15 more minutes. But lay your hand upon all that Job has, Satan says, and he will curse you, God, to your face. So it's like personal challenge. God accepts the personal challenge. Do anything you want to Job and his family, he tells Satan, and you'll see that he'll remain loyal to me. So it, it's, it's a strange moral tale with God playing with Job just to show off to Satan. So in short order, as you know, Satan destroys Job's wealth. He kills his 10 sons and daughters afflicts him with these unspeakably painful boils. Job's wife pleads with him to curse God. You know, that way perhaps God will kill him and 
put him out of his misery. But Job refuses. Should we accept only good from God and not accept evil? Again, be careful when you hear people just quote a verse. That's chapter 2, verse 10. Everyone writes that verse. But elsewhere he declares... Adonai natan v'adonai lakach yihishem Adonai mevorach. If you've ever been to a funeral that I've done, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Comes from Job. And then the friends enter. And by the way, this is worth sharing. They um, remain with him for seven days, if you, if you honed in on that, which is a basis for the Jewish practice of sitting shiva, that's not the name of an Indian prince, sitting Shiva. Um, Shiva. Shiva is the biblical Hebrew word for seven. Um, so when your Jewish friends lose a loved one, they often, after the funeral, will go home and they'll sit Shiva, which means they'll sit seven days of mourning, some three days, but you know, you know the idea, following the death of the immediate family member. And um, this is during the time when they come to urge him to repent, and I, all, I told you about this, how uh, throughout the book, um, if God has sent these punishments upon him for a just reason, um, he will acknowledge, but there is no just reason. So, Throughout, Job repeatedly demands that God will tell him why this evil has befallen him. And then um, after 37 tense chapters, that's how long it takes for God to speak. God speaks. And I'm going to, if you want to look at uh, Job 38... I'm just going to read verses 3, 4. Well, I'd ask you to read 3, 4, 12, 17. I'm going to skip around. 3, 4, 12, 17, 18, 32. Then I'm going to skip to, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm reading. Get prepared like a man, I will ask you and you tell me. I'm sorry if I'm not reading the exact translation you are. Where were you when I established the world? Tell me if you know so much. Did you ever command forth a morning? Have death's gates been revealed to you? Have you examined earth's expanse? Tell me if you know. Can you, and I'm skipping around in 38, 39, your eyes can wander. Um, can you guide the bear with her cubs? Does the hawk soar by your wisdom? Does the eagle mount at your command and make his nest on high? God answered Job and said, Will the contender with God yield? He who arraigns God must respond. And Job answers God and says, Lo, I am small. How can I ever answer you? My hand, I clap to my mouth. I have spoken once. I will not reply. I talked of things I did not know. Now I'm in chapter 40. Wonders beyond my ken. So in other words, as you, your eyes look to that text, God is God. And who are we to assume that we can understand everything that happens in this world? Who established the world? You? Or God. Now, let's be honest. This is not the answer we hope for. <laughs> if God is God and man is man, is there any other possible answer, though, than the one given to Job? Um, and so because the book of Job deals with this greatest question and challenge, God's ev uh, how, why God allows evil in the universe, it's questions, and with this I want to close and then show you a picture of Job. Why God allows evil in the universe. The questions from this book have preoccupied almost all sensitive religious figures. Jews living in the aftermath of the Holocaust, some of you may have even been born um, before 1945. So you lived in the lifetime of the Holocaust, and all of us are children. We know survivors of the Holocaust. Um, many Jews in the aftermath of the Holocaust often turn to this book for guidance. Now, this is Greenstein speaking. Um, it, I think it's hard to say if the situation of post-Holocaust Jews parallel.
parallels Job's. Um, because while God never tells Job why he suffers, the mere fact that Job finally hears God's voice in chapter 38 assures Job that God exists. And that's enough. God's revelation to the world since the Holocaust have been less unambiguous so that people are left not only with Job's question why, but with the agonizing question of God's existence. Bless you. God bless you. <laughs> um, and so this is, again, um, the subject of all our faiths. Uh, when people at cocktail parties, um, it, it's fascinating. Um, a good friend, Hallie, uh, was asking about me running marathons. And one of the reasons I run marathons um, is for three and a half hours, nobody bothers you. <laughs> if, if you're wise enough not to lie, but not to say you're a rabbi. So I was telling Hallie that when people ask me what I do when I'm running in, in these marathons, I don't lie, but I say I work with funeral homes. Because <laughs> I do a funeral every week. And then they change the subject. <laughs> what church do you go to? I, oh, a bunch, you know, I hop around. Um, but at cocktail parties, you know, raging atheists, you know, they want to know why God allows all these bad things to happen. And, um, you know, I, if I want to deflect the conversation, I say, boy, for an atheist, you sure are talking about God a lot. <laughs> um, but, but I basically say that, you know, you're right. If you believe in God, whatever your path to God, whatever your image of God, you do have to account for Job's question of why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer if God is just. But if you're an atheist, you have to explain everything else. You have to explain the wonder of this world and the mystery of your life. It's perhaps because of the less than flattering light in which the book of Job casts God. Because again, if we remember the context, God is putting on a show for Satan. And the rabbis say, not the God we believe in. You know, the God we believe in would not whip you, would not burn you, would not condemn you to fire. That would be a God who's into child abuse if we're all God's children. That's why the concept of hell is very troubling to a Jewish sensibility. Not, not that you, you aren't punished if you're unrepentant, but that a God would delight in whipping you or burning you. Um, so because of the less than flattering line in which the book of Job casts God, one of the leading rabbis in the Talmud claimed that Job never lived and that the entire book is an allegory about the problem of God and evil. Now, I want to share with you um, one of my favorite ways to teach Bible. Uh, and I wasn't sure I was going to share this until uh, another Episcopal priest, Catherine Bush and Richard Lawson were talking before about teaching early childhood. And uh, the way that I teach uh, Bible to not early learning, but to high school, is with photographs. Adi Nes, A-D-I-N-E-S, there's the Hebrew Adi Nes, is a world-renowned Israeli photographer who um, depicts famous stories with one image. This woman is Hagar, who was banished. You know, the mother of Ishmael, Abraham's made term, right? And you could see the pain on her face. Let me show you. So how does he depict um, Job? as an elderly man gasping for air. This is Job. 
There are no answers. Just the suffering of any person you and I have known. These are his friends. Trying to let him have it on a street in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and, they're, and he's looking at them like, what are you, crazy? You know, they're, they're all trying to defend God or trying to explain um, his suffering. I'll show you some more, by the way. Um, this is the way I teach Abraham. This is called Abraham and Isaac. This is a homeless man with his son in a grocery cart. The whole idea of sacrificing your, your, your son, your, only, your one and only son. Uh, and, and the question is, why is this Abraham and why is this Isaac? Um, this one may shock you. This is Noah, a naked man, drunk in an alleyway. That's the end of Noah, in case you didn't know. Um, this is Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and her Moabite, Ruth and Moabite and her Jewish mother-in-law. Um, this is David and Jonathan, best friends. So a great way to approach the text isn't to start necessarily with the verses, but to start with these pictures and then read them and then ask why. Um, I do want to leave time for your questions. I didn't mean to, to be a kosher pig and hog all the time. <laughs> we have five minutes for your questions, and then in two weeks I'll be back with more. Yes, please, questions. Hopefully we learned something today about Job we didn't know. The wisdom literature. I just wanted to lay it out, and, and uh, we'll, we'll move on in two weeks. Questions, please. I'm sure you have any, any on anything I alluded to. Please. Wow, it's all been said. Yes, sir. Can you say a bit about, and most of us would, would agree with you, that, that we share very similar um, traditions of interpreting Scripture. Um, our mantra in the Episcopal Church is Scripture, Tradition, and Reason. You get in this creative mix. Uh, in your tradition, um, and, and actually you, you're unique as well, what are sort of the foundations of your interpretive approach? Why do we share this similarity? Why do you sound like, in all seriousness, why do you sound like one of us? <laughs> Gosh, I'm glad it's mutual. I feel the same way whenever I hear you. I think because we know that our religious tradition and our text is a minimum of text and a maximum of interpretation. A minimum of text and a maximum of commentary. And that's why I, I think in the Episcopal tradition and in the Jewish tradition, um, the search is not for the literal because the literal is impossible. The search is for the eternal. The search is for what is the text imparting to us? And so when your rector threw in, when Richard threw in the, um, the title of these two weeks, and it'll be interesting to hear what Professor McKenzie says next week, uh, the contemporary quest for wisdom, um, there's an eisegetical and an exegetical approach, right? Are, are we reading into the text what happened in the Boston Marathon? Do we start with that and then read in? Or... I think you don't have to be eisegetical with Job because his questions prompt all these other deeper existential questions and meaning questions that your tradition embraces. You know, in other words, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to, to question. You know, God, God can take it, and um, who, who are we to submit? You don't have to submit. Um, with, and, and, and even our doubts are to be cherished. You know, to say that you stop being a Christian if you have momentary doubts, you know, is a betrayal of the cross, right? It's not an endorsement of. And so I think that's why we are, you know, kindred spirits. I, I was even, I was looking up in the lexicon and preparing for today uh, the word wisdom. And I mentioned to you Jeremiah 
is not this prophet who says that punishment is about what I did, that, that, I'm, that, that my suffering is justified. He said, I, I, I didn't. And he's the one who uses the word, thus says the eternal one, let not the wise glory in their wisdom. This is Jeremiah 9, uh, verse 22. Let not the wise glory in their wisdom, let not the mighty glory in their might, let not the rich glory in their riches, but let them who glory glory in this, that they understand me, and then what does that mean? That I, the eternal, practice kindness, justice in the earth, because it's in these things do I delight, says the eternal one. And so maybe the contemporary quest for wisdom um, and what Job is pointing towards um, and why he's schooling his friends is you don't have to say anything to someone who's suffered a loss. Don't give me pat answers like my 10 kids are in a better place now or God only tests... What, what is it? Yeah, God only tests the strongest. Make me weak. You know, so I think the other reason that we're kindred spirits is Pat answers theology, theologically. Well, if they work for you, good. But they don't work for a lot of people. They don't work for most people if you think it through. And I think that's why. And maybe that's why whatever path we live as Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindus, whatever, may we live our faith tradition in such a way that if God were a human being, God would want to be a friend and live in our home. See, that's my question, no matter what the theology is. Would God want to be my friend if I were that harsh in judging someone's suffering as justified for something they did when they didn't? I was just speaking at Baptist Hospital. I mean, there was a doctor who died there from lung cancer, who never smoked a cigarette in his life. Where's the justice in that? Doctor who was an oncological surgeon, saved lives, and saw on his own screen that he had pancreatic cancer. And so thank God for your tradition, which doesn't say, just accept that that was God's will. <laughs> which, and so I think that also is why this book is not just universal, but for those who want to do more than just quote chapter 2, verse 10. You know, I've been in settings where um, particularly evangelicals will quote, well, this, Job was patient, Job accepted. You haven't read the whole context. And I think that's why we are. Um, I think it's 1020. Do not miss services today. I hear there's a really great sermon. Thanks for having me. Is that okay? Thank you. Oh, you. Perfect. Oh. Thank you. And I'll see you in two. Absolutely.